Wigan, the northwest of England. 1.45 a.m. Valentine's night. And there's trouble at a town centre nightclub. A bouncer has already been stabbed in the thigh. As another bouncer goes in to sort things out, the fight spills onto the street. Tonight, inside Britain's knife crime epidemic. Cut the main artery to my heart. Families in torment. It's time to swoon, and you would never think so much blood could come out of something like that. Close calls. You bleed to death in seven minutes, but and the average for an ambulance to get to you is eight minutes. The truth. I know people, including myself at one time, that would have said I feel naked if I don't have my knife on me. South London, November last year. The police are after a murderer. A teenager accused of stabbing another teenager to death. We're working in conjunction with the, uh, the murder squad in another lead that they've got. We got on the gentleman that we're going after this morning. 322 people were stabbed to death in Britain last year. Increasingly, the victims are teenagers caught in a spiral of violence. It was a very savage beating for a young man. Um, he was struck with, uh, with weapons, implements, uh, and he was stabbed several times. Youngsters who've become hooked on gang culture and knives. He's known for weapons, gang membership, um, possession of a stun gun. He mixes with the people that he shouldn't be mixing with. Um, and as I said, he's known for violence, he's known for, for gang-related violence. Um, and that's not something that we tolerate. Open the door, please, please. Open the door, please, or we'll open it for you. OK, right, well, we've got, we've got life. Good morning. In London, 28 teenagers were killed last year leading the Metropolitan Police to make knife crime, rather than terrorism, their number one priority. Yeah, hello, mate. Just come here. You're under arrest on suspicion of being involved in the murder of and You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you fail to mention when questioned something which would later rely upon court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. No. Don't, don't say anything now, mate. Hmm? Right, well, where, where's your phone? You're the only teenager in the whole world who hasn't got a phone. It's broken. If your phone's broken, it's up there, is it? That's lovely. Right, if you'd set that on. This film will bring together those involved in the growing death toll. The police, criminologists, relatives of the victims, survivors and the accused to try and find some answers. There has been a shift in the nature of knife homicide in particular, with a sh sharp increase in the number of young victims. Um, in London, in the last year, the number of knife victims about doubled. It's 2.30 a.m. East London. These three men have just left a nightclub, heading for a car they've left nearby. A CCTV operator is tracking them because he thinks they could be vandals. This is 17-year-old Michael Lynch, a burglar on bail, who is about to become a murderer. The punch is unprovoked. Lynch joins in. But he isn't only using his fists. He has a knife in his pocket, and just out of sight of the camera, Lynch stabs one of the two men in the heart, fatally. The stab man is a 20-year-old student from Essex, Daniel Pollan, on a night out celebrating his best friend Andy Griffith's 20th birthday. Daniel tried to protect Andy and then when they turned on him he puts his hands up. That is a peaceful gesture, it's not violent, it's not like he was going to attack them. He put his hands up as if to say, what do you want? And they still attacked him after doing that. Now Lynch turns on Andy, stabbing him in the chest and back. Daniel Pollan is still standing, trying to help. One of the men chases him away. The three attackers drive off, heading home, only 40 seconds after the attack began.
Meanwhile, another CCTV camera records Daniel collapsing, with blood pouring from his heart. Andy Griffiths is now on his feet, barely conscious, also bleeding heavily. But help is at hand. Not the police or ambulance. Daniel's sister, Kirsty, has arrived, as arranged, to pick him and Andy up from the town centre. As we sort of pulled into the brewery car park, you can sort of look across it. And I was like, oh, I can't see anyone. So I thought I'll like, get my phone out and call, call him. And sort of as we just turned around the po uh, corner, my sort of headlights picked up and he was just sort of lying in the middle of the road, like not moving. And um, I sort of stopped the car and it was just like blood everywhere. <laughs> so um, I like, me and my friend, I jumped out of the car and we like called the ambulance. His eyes were open, but he wasn't like responding to anything we were sort of saying to him. There was just a tiny cut in his t shirt and there was just the most tiniest wound, and you would never think sort of so much blood and could come out or something like that. Within minutes, police and ambulance are also on the scene, trying desperately to save Daniel's life. Daniel was stabbed once. Andy Griffiths four times. The first blow broke Andy's jaw, knocking him out. Neither he nor Daniel know the men who are attacking them. The first thing I remember was feeling this almighty pain in the right side of my face. And then the next thing I saw was um, Michael Noka pulling the phone away from me and this sort of punching motion, sort of someone hitting me in the back. The someone was Michael Lynch. Using the knife he'd punctured Daniel's heart with, this time Andy didn't pass out and watched as the three escaped. I was sort of laying on my side, saw a car in the distance with the door slightly ajar, someone looking out of it at me, making sure that I was down and not able to get up. Andy still has no idea he and his best friend have been stabbed. So the car went speeding off. I managed to get myself up, thinking, Where, where's Dan? Is, is, he, is he in that car? Is he somewhere around here? Um, what, what just happened? And then I was thinking, my chest really hurts. So I looked down and then there was just, I was just pouring with blood. I'd, I knew I'd been stabbed then. In shock, Andy Griffiths staggers off to find help. Initially back to the nightclub and from there to an ambulance, which took him to hospital. As he lay in the ER, Andy realised the person in the next bed was dying. So I was saying, is that my friend? Is that my friend? We were getting really irate with them because they weren't, I could tell they weren't telling me something. I tried to pull out all my drips. I tried to get out of the bed to go to him. But he was, con he was connected up to the ECG machine at the time. And it was just flatlining. Lots of doctors were coming in and asking if he was allergic to things and things like that. And you kind of think, oh, you know, it'll be all right. He's going to be OK. He will survive. And then they come in and they just tell you that they're really sorry, but he died. And you just can't believe it. It's the most surreal thing in the world. Daniel's killer was caught quickly. The number plate on the car led police right to him. Michael Lynch was sentenced to a minimum of 15 years. His accomplices got five years each. The CCTV of Daniel Pollan's murder is being shown because his family want everyone to see what really happened. We came to the decision that we did want the CCTV to be released in public because it's such an unprovoked attack. I think it's important that people do see that, you know, it's not just about gang culture. It's not, you know, knives aren't used just in gang culture. Andrew and like my brother Daniel didn't do anything in any way to cause what happens to them. I just think people need to realise, you know, n knife crime is everywhere, it happens all the time. And, it, and that's why I think it's quite important that people do see it. We just stated there was a large group of uh, youths hanging around uh, outside and inside the location. Um, all wearing hoodies, I believe some of them were uh, underage. Um, I'll just have a look, just uh, see what's going on down there. The police's main tactic to prevent stabbings is stop and search. Last year, this led to nearly 6,000 arrests in London alone, 
with over three and a half thousand bladed weapons taken off the streets. Stop and search is obviously a very valuable tool because if we're not out there and we're not implementing that search power, then there's absolutely no reason why people aren't going to be willing just to arm themselves for any reason. This time, Lewisham's stop and search team are after teenagers who've been robbing gamblers at knife point outside of bookies. There's been a bit of a trend of people that have been in the bookmakers legitimately who have won one cash have left and then they've been followed away by groups of youths. Listen to what I'm going to say, right? Yeah. We've just got information that a group of youths are being hanging outside the bookmakers, OK? Because of that, and because we believe that you may have been the youths that have been hanging around outside the um, bookmakers, OK? You're, you're going to be searched, OK? Do you understand what I'm saying? A copy of the search record when it's completed, which you can have at any time, you can have it now or in 12 months' time from any police station. You got anything at all on you that you shouldn't have? Come on, I would have legged it. Oh, cool, no, nothing that can hurt me or anything, no? Critics say stop and search doesn't prevent stabbings. It alienates London's young. These youngsters aren't robbers, nor are they carrying knives. They say the police have got it all wrong. These are not doing their job properly. That's why there's too much murders. Pathetic. Police commanders say most citizens back their stop and search strategy. Young people were telling us you're the people in authority, you should be doing something about this, and we accept that stop and search is one of the ways in which you can do something about this to make us feel safer. In the longer term, clearly, stop and search uh, is quite an intrusive power, uh, and it has to be used extremely sensitively. That's it. Have a good evening, Mama, yeah. receipts, take care. Sir. Where's the receipt? Okay, you are. <laughs> Please don't well, start. Yeah, like, don't start. <laughs> Have a good one. Good shall I uh, Sure will. Pathetic, mate. We make more money than you, mate. Can I MC? What we're probably finding less often than more often um, weapons on youths, um, purely because uh, the, the youths can see that we're coming. We do use unmarked vehicles, but they are aware of the unmarked vehicles that we're using quite often, more often than not. Um, so what they'll tend to do is, is hide or, or stash weapons in, say, for argument, say, a wheelie bin or in a front garden. In some parts of South London, stashing knives doesn't always work. In Croydon, the police have a way of finding them. His name is Kaiser. Nice. It was kind of stuck in there. It was just, the blade was kind of half stuck in the mud. It's only been there overnight. Classic example of uh, why this area is chosen by us. It's used as a cut through. We know gang members and groups do use this area, and this just sort of uh, vindicates that we're taking this tactic. Just found by the dog in the corner. Now that is the, a typical sort of weapon that we would expect to find in this area. Um, I must admit that there's a bit of surprise around the axe. I wouldn't have expected to find the axe, but certainly this is the typical sort of item and the typical sort of thing that a lot of the young youths are carrying. Simple kitchen knives, small, easily concealable. It isn't only bladed weapons that Kaiser has a nose for. See all these notches there? Clearly not being used for uh, baseball, is it? I don't think balls do that sort of mark, so that actually is a very, very good find. At Croydon Police Station, Sergeant Birmingham and PC Reeve keep the knives they find under lock and key. If you carry a knife, uh, and my guys on you, we will we, we'll catch you. We uh, recover 100 knives per month uh, on average here on the Croydon Borough, mainly from stop and search also weapon sweeps in set areas. The knives such as the, the Gurkha knife, um, the samurai knife um, or sword, but it is the kitchen knife. The kitchen knife is, is pivotal. It is the most common found uh, knife or implement that we, uh, we, we discover on the streets. They are readily accessible. They're easy to purchase and they're easy in the home to pick up before you go out the front door. Sometimes if, if a guy or, or a lady's carrying an item like that, they'll make up a, a cardboard sheath and that can be carried in their waistband. Um, a knife can be carried around the waist in the belt We've also had uh, incidents where a knife like that can be carried uh, under the shoe. They'll take the shoe off and, and that, can, that can live under the, um, the inner sole of the shoe. 
If you're worried or concerned about your son or daughter, you know, engage your child before they go out. Please check your kitchen, make sure there's nothing missing. Getting people to report missing knives, or people who have them, is easier said than done. Had the passengers waiting at this South London bus stop called the police when they saw two 18-year-olds with a knife, this mother might not be grieving for her 20-year-old son, Billy Ward. This is where Billy died after a brawl on a bus. He was stabbed nine times. Never be forgotten, Jesse. Never. His assailants were caught on CCTV minutes beforehand as they waited for a night bus due at 3 a.m. Starfield Badza and Junior Labango were openly aggressive. Labango uh, was uh, brandishing a knife at the bus stop. Um, Badza was there as well. Uh, he was goading people. Um, several people saw the knife uh, and no one called us. If, if, some, if somebody had called us on the night, potentially we could have uh, prevented the murder of Billy Ward. Billy Ward got on the bus at the next stop. The internal CCTV recorded everything that happened. Trouble started almost immediately. Badza squares up to Billy Ward his baseball cap touching Billy's head and his finger jabbing in Billy's face. Badza began to uh, pick arguments with other passengers and more specifically Billy Ward. That resulted in a physical altercation. Another passenger intervenes to move Badza to the front of the bus, away from Billy. The pair then turn their attention to stealing from a sleeping passenger. Then, as Badza prepares to get off the bus, he has another go at Billy Ward, and a fight starts. The Bango had the knife. He and Badsa were goading people on the bus, so it was my belief that they were prepared to, to use the knife if they encountered trouble. At the stop, the punch-up spills off the bus and onto the street. Badsa grabs Billy Ward in an arm lock before dragging him down an alley. The Bango follows. Seconds later, Billy Ward emerges from the alley and then collapses, having been stabbed many times by Labango. It was uh, nine stab wounds, uh, a relentless attack with, with a knife, and unfortunately the, the, the fatal uh, knife wound uh, pierced Billy Ward's uh, heart and he stood no chance. The CCTV images helped convict Labango and Badza of murder. Now both are serving a minimum of 18 years in prison. And that's all out, and it Billy did justice. It still don't bring you back, baby, is it? And I tell him all bits and pieces still how I feel. And said he knows that he's looking at me. Love him. He's more likely up there saying, Mum, shut up. But... Billy's mother, Jenny, spends her days wondering what might have been. Billy should be here with us all, you know. Parting still. News like his parties. So lose someone special in your life, you know, you bring them up and have that taken away from you. It is hard. Jenny Ward is also in despair over the ever increasing death toll. Since Billy, I mean look how many they've been, you know, usually here every day, every week. You know, it's too much now, it's got to stop some somewhere down the line. Since Billy died. Three more teenagers have been stabbed to death in this part of London. To try and stem the flow, the Croydon police have been looking for ways to stop youngsters getting involved with knives in the first place. Their youth engagement team is run by Sergeant Birmingham, who believes gang culture lies at the root of the problem. His wall has a gangland rogues gallery. There is an escalation of the use of weapons. Crimes of violence have always occurred, but the use of a knife uh, and the use of a firearm they, they have increased, so there's no two ways about that. What happens is, is one gang's walking the streets uh, with, with some knives and they've got a beef or an argument with another gang. Um, the way to, to facilitate your, your own safety is for you to, to tool up, for you to carry a weapon. Uh, and the escalation is as these guys get older and their, their criminal uh, tentacles sort of spread, they have, you know, they have to protect their, their own image and they have to protect their own um, business and that's when they'll start to use a firearm. Um, that is happening, that dynamic for the last two years has been on the increase. Sergeant Birmingham's team have found the internet gives them the best lowdown on what their local gangs are up to. 
Some, like the T-Block or GMG, Get Money Gangsters, even have their own websites. The GMG um, to T-Block, T-Block another gang uh, from the Lambeth area, a younger group as well. No one is, no one's known as Dave or, or Terry, everyone's known by their street names. Um, T-Spar, Stabber, um, Nichols, Inch, uh, Flips, I mean, most of the names, we, we would know the guys on the streets. Um, little Biker, it's sort of sexy having a gun with lots of dollars and, and pound notes and uh, it, it's all for show, it, you know, the whole, the whole, the whole issue um, is a facade, the whole gang thing, it's about getting rich, hurting people. Um, what we've got to do, you know, involving the parents is we've got to, you know, stress them that, that there's no future in carrying the weapons. You know, the only way to get on in life is, is get yourself an education, get your head down and, uh, and be a good person. Being a good person is something Croydon's youth engagement team takes seriously, and this involves taking unusual steps. Knocking on the doors of teenagers who might be vulnerable to the influence of gangs like the GMG, who operate apprentice schemes for new members. What you have is a gang member who will adopt, if you like, an apprentice who becomes younger, then they in turn adopt someone who becomes little. Generally what we find is that they will be gaining protection from somebody further up the chain, not necessarily in this GMG gang. It could be a more unpleasant set of people. Little <laughs> is his street name. This is the home of a young lad who the team fear might have become an apprentice. PC Reeve isn't making an arrest. He's come here to deliver a warning. No crime has been committed. This is another new initiative, letting the boy's mother know that PC Reeve has been keeping an eye on her son. We stopped him quite frequently with a number of guys that we know to be in gangs. Okay. Um, the stuff that he's written on his wall suggests that he's in a gang. There are little sim um, signs like that that we can pick up on, but we can tell you what those signs are as well, so you can look out for them. And obviously if there's um, issues where you can come to us and say, look, I think in a bit of trouble, we can help to get him out of it. If we have to arrest people because they've got what we believe to be stolen property, then we're going to do that. But I'd rather come round here, have a cup of coffee with you and say, look, this gang stuff isn't for you, mate. Let's find you an activity each evening that, you, that can keep you off the street and do stuff like that. Does that sound a little bit better than being woken up at six o'clock in the morning by a lot of um, policemen coming through your door? Yeah, it's got to be better, isn't it? While London's police try to make joining a gang unattractive, the reasons why teenagers embrace gang membership are being studied by one of Britain's leading criminologists. In the most deprived urban areas in London, I think young people see that their prospects of gaining sufficient money through gainful employment to buy a home, to purchase a car, to settle down and you know, form a relationship and have children, they see themselves as being prevented from achieving those indicators, those signs of material success. And therefore, their lives, their horizons, for many people, are relatively limited. They're limited to, am I going to get through today without being attacked? Am I going to get from home to school, or from home to the youth club, or from home to hang out on the streets without being attacked by other young people? Am I going to survive today without somebody disrespecting me? Professor Bowling's research shows that some young people see a gang as the only way to be part of a family. When somebody says, you know, join our clique, join our crew, we'll protect you, We'll be your, your homies, we'll be your, the people who, who you can hang with, we'll be like your family, your fam, your, you know, you, you, the people that, that will look after you and protect you and will give you a sense of self-esteem and, and, and protection. In that context, I think that um, however reluctant they may be at first, many young people will choose the protection and the safety of a gang and will choose the protection and the safety that they feel of carrying a weapon Teenagers who carry weapons are usually reluctant to talk about the reasons why. An exception is Alika, age 17 and a former South London gang member. I know people, including myself at one time, that would have said, I feel naked if I don't have my knife on me. Take my knife off me and I don't feel right. I don't feel right, I feel like it's part of me and that's not a joke. Guys who strap it to their legs at a young age, they get a rubber band. The first thing they're tying up is not a pick up, it's not a stack of money, or they're not tying up a rubber band ball. The first thing they're learning how to tie up is how can I tie this rubber band around my leg and around my knife, keep it in place. And they love that. Alika no longer runs with a gang, or batch as he calls them. 
Nowadays, he tries to steer fellow teenagers away from knife crime. But he remembers only too well the time he was the batch apprentice, given a knife by a respected gang member. I felt the power when I held the knife. When I saw it, when I looked at it, and I knew who had held it, and obviously by now I was rolling on some sort of batch. And I know that the person who had it before me is someone that already holds respect to the batch. It made me feel like his job, basically, he's giving me his respect, he's, he's giving me that responsibility. And he's like, yeah, I could trust you here. Being trusted with the knife was one thing, taking it along to fights he got into, quite another. If I had been carrying a knife on a situation where I actually was to get into a fight and I got blood rage, I would have definitely done it. Because when adrenaline goes in, you don't know what you're doing. You don't remember. And that's a lot of the things that happens with the young youth nowadays. And that's the thing that people don't realise. You carry it on you. You're most likely going to use it if case that situation comes along. Where back in the day you would have punched someone, you won't punch someone this time. Because your mind is much more smarter than that. Your mind would be like, hold on, you got it on you. Quickly, flick it up. By the time you realise, you're already getting some sort of sentence thrown at your face. The sentence for adults who take a knife onto the street is up to four years in jail. The crackdown on knife crime is also pulling in shopkeepers who illegally sell knives to teenagers under the age of 18. They're not being targeted by the police, but by trading standards officers who use unconventional methods. A 13-year-old boy is going undercover to try and buy knives as a test purchaser. Primarily this morning we're concentrating on the sale of knives. If it were a natural scenario where, where you were going in to buy something, how would you go about it? Would you just pick up a knife or might you pick up other items? The 13-year-old's mission is to find out who sells knives to underage children and who doesn't. If anyone asks you how old you are, you say you're 13, right? It's a bit of a detective job. You don't want to tweak that you're involved in an operation. The whole operation is being secretly filmed for evidential purposes. And in the first shop he visits, he's able to buy two kitchen knives. He wasn't asked any questions, uh, nothing at all was asked of him, uh, and he simply purchased the items. In the second shop, the undercover teenager is able to buy a knife with a four-inch blade. Can you confirm you just sold that? Yeah. In shop number three, the boy goes for the biggest blade he can find. It's particularly worrying as the age of our test purchaser is, is only 13 years old and he's able to quite readily buy this item. A grip jab saw, which looks lethal. With the evidence in the bag, the trading standards team can move in. I presume you're obviously aware that it's, it's an offence to sell knives to children under 18 years of age. Shopkeepers who illegally sell knives to children can be fined up to £5,000. We've run over 1,300 trading standards operations uh, and about three in ten of those operations have led to us being able to buy a knife or a young person on our behalf buy a knife. So we think that's quite worrying. What we've done about that is uh, ministers and myself have had in the British Retail Consortium uh, and the industry uh, to some very productive talks uh, and there will be a pledge coming out to clamp down on it by the, by the stores uh, so we should expect to see an improvement. In North London, the police are after school children who carry knives. Official research has shown that a third of school children have carried a knife at one time or another. Some schools don't want to be seen uh, as having knife arches or as taking these types of interventions. Uh, but I would turn the argument the other way around and I would say the schools that are doing those things are ensuring that there is a good, safe learning environment for their pupils and are being proactive in addressing any issues that the young people might have. The law has recently been changed to allow teachers and police to search school children without parental permission. Within a mile of this school, three youngsters have been stabbed to death. Not that long ago, I used to have a friend who used to play together and everything, and every time he'd been bullied by all the students, and one day he decided to carry a knife, 
and it was used against him at the, at the action of him trying to use it against the other person and he got stabbed and I couldn't, I didn't see him until now I can't see him. He was in hospital for a long time bleeding and eventually he died because of a blood clot in his stomach and I never saw him. A significant minority of young people do carry knives, um, as a matter of course, and they would be um, things like uh, pen knives, uh, for example, um, short bladed knives, um, but also a small minority are carrying kitchen knives. And I think that is a phenomenon which is probably new and is quite troubling. Like in our school, the stabbing happened in our school, um, so and you can notice them in the past that it's like more people are getting stabbed because the law is not going high enough. That's why people do it because they know that it's about like five years basis, so they know that they can just get away with it. The school children also know that postcodes and gangs play a part, a big one. Most people just carry knives because they want to have a gang fight or just because, oh, you come from N17, oh, you come from East London, oh, you come from this. People want to just fight because of other territory. But it's nothing about that because we're all just normal people. It's just the name that we're given around our area, like, oh, we're N17. Does that make a, make a reason why we should fight another area? It doesn't make a reason. We're all the same. It's just silly. It's not only the kids and the school which get searched. The police sweep takes in nearby housing estates. On one of them, a knife blade has been found. It appears to be a kitchen knife, which is notoriously what the youngsters do tend to use. It's, it's what they can get from their, uh, their kitchens. Increasingly, Towns and cities throughout the UK are using CCTV to try and spot knives and catch those responsible for the stabbings. Here in Wigan, in Lancashire, a council CCTV operator was able to not only warn the police about the man running amok with two knives, but also to let them know where he craftily hid them in an attempt to avoid arrest. Under the police car. The same CCTV system helped identify and convict three men who attacked and stabbed an innocent 21-year-old outside Wigan's town centre nightclub. The operator's feedback got medical help to the scene faster and the victim was saved from bleeding to death from a severed artery. But Lancashire or London aren't the worst places in Britain for knife crime. Scotland is. If you are male, aged between 10 and 29, you are five times more likely to be stabbed to death north of the border than anywhere else. We have a chronic problem with violence in, in, in Scotland. In Scotland, our homicide rate uh, is, for the most at-risk group, is 10, uh, between 10 and 29-year-old males, is 5.3 per 100,000 of a population. Um, the equivalent rate in England is one per 100,000 of a population. Aberdeen. North East Scotland. This children's playground is the scene of Scotland's latest stabbing. Two days ago, John Adams' brother Ryan was attacked with a knife. The incident happened just down there, beside the, where the two cars are parked. It happened in the afternoon, so everybody would have seen most of it what had happened. John's brother, Ryan, is being treated here, in the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. Doctors saved his life, and already he's up and about, to the great relief of his mother, Fiona. They said there was some bleeding somewhere in his body, and he was getting an ultrasound scan beside his heart, and uh, his stomach was all hard, and he was white. And the next minute he went away and he came back, and he says, was bleeding around his heart, so he used to go to get an operation. So we never got to see him until he came out to operate in theatre. Ryan is 17. These wounds were inflicted just 48 hours ago. He was stabbed four times. My heart's like right here. That Steve clipped up uh, the main artery to my heart. Then. That's the other stab wound there. And you got the end to my stomach was there. Then 
Oh, no, no, you know, there's the three tubes. So you're going to need body. Then they the slice up the open to get to my heart for uh, heart right here. Then for my stomach, they just up uh, there. For up, uh, for uh, in. Ah, uh, for uh, in. And you know my back. The blade was like three inches or something. A little kitchen knife. And it does that. I have for the rest of my life. Ryan owes his life not only to his surgeons, but also to a boy at the playground where he was attacked, who wrapped him tightly in a jacket to stop the bleeding. I lifted up my top, but then I just seen I had him right beside my heart, and it just, the blood just went, just like see spot out, a bit of fat or something. And then I jumped over my, then I jumped over the park fence, and I just fell to the ground. This boy saved my life when he put a jacket around me and held me pure tight. Oh, I still can't believe it. It was just another day in my life over. Aberdeen is not the worst place in Scotland for knife crime. Glasgow is. It's also the murder capital of Britain, with more killings per head of population than London. We have three and a half times the number of homicides committed by using a knife than anywhere else in the UK. Three times means around 40 fatal stabbings a year in Glasgow alone, with a further 214 attempted murders with knives. Almost all are gang-related, statistics which some Scots take for granted. We call that recreational violence, and, it, and it's based around territory. And the territories that we have and the gangs who operate within them have been there for 40, 50, 60 years. It's the same gang names. Uh, they fight in the same areas. If you, and, and they will fight and attack you because you don't come from that area. We have um, probably 100 and odd gangs in, in, in the west of Scotland. Um, in one area of, of Glasgow, in the East End, we've got 55 gangs. We've got about 700 members of, of those gangs, and they'll range in age from 12 up to early 20s. Matthew McAllister, 16, and Dennis Scott, 19, live in Glasgow's East End. They also know all about the gangs. Dentoy, Baltoy, uh, Provi, uh, Drummy, Agro, Skinheads, Tom. Over here, Skinheads, this is Wellhurst, and mostly. The bottom part of it's the worst, that's where mostly all the fighting that happens. It's torn and skin needs that hate each other the most. Some of them can get slashed, some can get stabbed, or else you can get chopped with a sword or something. If you were going to walk through there, then you would need to have something on you. <laughs> Somebody shouting at the bus, you're funny. <laughs> The territorialism that underpins these Scottish conflicts is being studied by Professor Keith Kintray at Glasgow University. He's discovered that the battle lines get drawn at an early age. These maps represent um, a particular part of Glasgow and they were drawn by young men who were uh, attending the same school. The main road goes down the middle and for this guy here, uh, he feels safe uh, in his home territory, which is the area marked with the red uh, boundary, and the other side is where it's unsafe, which is marked don't go on here. And for this guy, it's safe on this side, and it's unsafe on this side. It's a mirror image of that one. These territories are both very, very clearly uh, 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 demarcated. Can he cross that road and can he cross that road and he can? So, can you go to the garage, darling? You? you go down to get a packet of fags or something. Uh, you, you've got a barrel running there chasing you, so you have. The threat from the Barrel gang is bad enough when you live across the street. It becomes positively lethal when your parents split up and move house, putting you into enemy territory. My dad moved to Barrel, so he did. And my mum kicked us out, and I had to go stay with him. And they knew that I was very scoop, they smashed my dad's motor up, put his house windies in, so then my dad kicked us out, he wanted nothing to do because it was causing him hassle. So my mum took us back in. Can he go anywhere? I got done with a, what's he called, 
a Stanley, I got caught earlier, so I did the polis, but I just grabbed it, I had a Stanley in my pocket, I got done with that. See, the day that happened to me, that was it, man, bang, never out again, I sat in the house now. If we're in here, we're all right, no deal saying nothing, but besides if any, like, these people see anything happening, they'll run there and help you, so they will. It's just it, man. If you've got other schemes, you'll probably take a knife or something with you to keep yourself safe, know what I mean? That's what that's for. Sometimes the motivation for joining a gang is as simple as because there's, that's what you do. That's the norm. Because your big brother's in the gang. Because your dad was in the gang or your uncle was the gang. Um, or you don't have a choice, you've got nothing else to do and it seems I'll just, my friends in the gang will do it. So I, I don't know that young men make that conscious decision that it's about to, to start. Sometimes there isn't a choice in it, it's what's there. What's here now in this part of Scotland is an escalating horror involving weapons even more powerful and dangerous than knives. I jumped in a boot with taser guns and all that now. The actual taser guns with the polish shows have got aim that now. But like big machetes, like blade and it's about that size. I was fighting me Trossock Street and that. And we were running around a corner and a wee guy ran around. Whacked us with a f big sword. I see that one now. That was on a bus that bit. Just somebody ran up, bang man, how are you? Any day, poor man, could have had an artery or anything, man, but stuff happens. Stuff happens all the time here, and not everyone walks away with just a scar. Hi, Scott, how are you, mate? How are you doing, Dad? How about yourself? Aye, ah, great. Brilliant. You shoving the kettle on? Uh, I don't know. All right. Seven years ago, Scott Breslin was an active teenager, but since being stabbed at the age of 16, he's unable to use his limbs and needs constant help. He's a normal 16 year old, so I used to sort of run and jump and climbing and whatnot, and then all of a sudden these limbs aren't open to him anymore. Scott was the victim of an unprovoked attack by two fellow teenagers. A single knife wound left him a quadriplegic for life. This was the spot here where that actually happened. Just seen the knife came round the side of me, stabbed me in the neck, and it just felt like a punch. As soon as I, I felt that punch, I just hit the ground and the lights went out. I lost my teeth, shattered my nose. The spot in my neck is probably about a centimetre long, but it resulted in me being paralysed from the neck down now. The teenagers who attacked Scott were caught and sent to prison, but Scott's father feels let down. To me, the punishment they got didn't suit the crime. Those two guys, one was sentenced to ten years, one was sentenced to four years. Uh, the one that was sentenced to four years did two and a half. He was out pretty much no long after Scott got out of hospital. Because of the way the judicial system works, they only start to have half their sentence, which is the biggest betrayal of all. They're, out, they're both out now, but I'm confined to a lifetime in a wheelchair. At one of Glasgow's biggest hospitals, Doctors treat over 700 knife injuries every year. Most are truly horrific, even when you know the victim survived. Quite clearly, there's a, a knife sticking into this man's back. This is in within what we call the cardiac danger area, and you know the lungs are there. There is the major artery from the heart there. You can actually reach the heart there or the aorta, and that can be a fatal injury very, very easily. Rudy Crawford is the senior consultant surgeon in the A&E department. He's seen every kind of knife injury. Machetes are very popular. They used to sell them down the barrels for three or four pounds, you know, um, and, and it's surprisingly, surprising the number of people that carry them about the person. Here's our other machete injuries, which has gone right through the muscles uh, on the back, right down to the rib cage. The catalogue of injuries is testament to the skills of the surgeons and a damnation on those who inflict them. Over the years I've almost been driven to despair at, at the frequency and the prevalence of the violence that exists, you know, and particularly at nights and weekends, and, and a lot of it involves alcohol. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes you despair for humankind because a lot of it is just, is just sheer uh, barbarity. Many of Glasgow's stab victims do not even tell the police what happened to them. In our experience, 
at least a half of them are never reported to the police and in some cases you know up to 70 percent may not be reported dr crawford has been treating stab victims for 30 years he believes that all too often the people who do the stabbing don't fully realize what they are doing over the years i've come to the conclusion that most people that carry knives and use knives don't see beyond the next six inches or beyond the, the, the next ten minutes. They, they, they don't seem to understand the consequences of these things. It's often a matter of millimetres that make the difference between a trivial injury and a fatal injury. And of course there's this common misconception that if you use a small knife or a small blade that you cannot inflict a serious injury on someone and that's just not true. I mean I could kill you without any problem with a half inch a blade um, and, and the the, the, there, are, there are major blood vessels very close to the surface of the body, major organs that are very easy to reach even with short bladed weapons. And of course if these people don't spend years studying anatomy like I have, they don't know how to avoid these things. Avoiding knives in Glasgow isn't easy. These young men are here to pay tribute to a teenage friend, nicknamed Biscuit, who was stabbed to death, possibly by accident. Biscuit, rest in peace. Uh, I don't think it was meant, but um, it was just, um, it was like arguing with somebody and somebody just knifed him. And he was breaking the heart and then he died. So that's, that's just the mention of Biscuit, rest in peace. What age was he again? Um, 18. But she was like, it, it, it was somebody we knew. That done it. So, um, the way it affected us was kind of gutted and all that and whatever, all that. But that's a bit, I can't really tell you. But the honesty doesn't extend to calling the police or telling them who did it. You don't, oh. you don't grass, you can't grass. It's one thing nobody can do. Is there someone that's. You don't do it? Uh, if you're a grass, then that's it. Well, you're, you're an outcast, that. I'm done. Uh, so that's how when, when, when people get stabbed or slashed or whatever and they're in the hospital and all that, they don't want to tell a poor set because they want to get their name back. In he's on. 15 outside, man, about 25 and inside. Oh, man, me and my pals went into a shop to steal a, steal a bottle of vodka, that man. The guy ran out and grabbed him, so I put a boat where he said his brother chopped his. Last thing I remember was an ambulance. <laughs> Hey, where's that scar with pride, big Kev? <laughs> <laughs> hey, where's that little Rolex? <laughs> show me, show me you the shot. Aye. This is his track, Max. Where that is, you have it. Kitchen double right through there. Right there, through the other side. Eh, what else? Don't know what else to say. He's been stabbed, he's been slashed. He's been mucked. So he's been shot, he's been shagged. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been jilled. <laughs> the laughter conceals a terrible legacy. A generation or more of Scottish men who have lived to tell the tale of their own stabbings. Take a walk down uh, most streets in the west of Scotland and you'll pass some young man or some older man who has a, a, a severe facial scar and that will inhibit them for the rest of their lives. I don't know what they're standing there, they're open asia. That happened to me, they could be really on my lap. They're there, right up. So I mean, sure, I don't know what it is. But I don't know the fact that it didn't. Would you employ someone with a scar like that? Kind of a serious effect in relationships. How would you have a good relationship with that? It's to see it with, with you know, a, 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 a woman, for instance, those, those personal relationships, or even friendly relationships with with other men and, and peers. How would you how would you relate to them? And the thing is, when you look at that man, that's what you think. But the truth is, if he has a scar on his face, he's a victim. I was held in, my eyes were shut, I was steaming, <laughs> and they to make it on my face instead of my body because I don't look at my body every day. So that's my last thing. It's important. It's a show. It's a show. Get Abby further there, right? He's probably going to grow up to be running about in like a gang and, and drinking and running about the streets and beating people up. It's just the way it is. It's a knife culture. Britain's knife culture finally reached critical mass last September 
when 2,000 people took to the streets of London to demand tougher action against knife crime and an end to the killings. Actress Brooke Kinsella, whose 16-year-old brother Ben was stabbed to death in July, was one of hundreds of bereaved relatives on the march. As was Damilola Taylor's father, Richard. And in Hyde Park, Brooke Kinsella's fellow actress, Linda Robson, added her voice to the campaign. We are all here today to remember the families and loved ones who have been victims of this horrendous knife and gun culture. It wasn't only Londoners who took to the streets to hear one of Britain's leading anti-knife crime campaigners call for peace. Peace is your business, my business, everybody's business, and we must fight for the sake of our children. That's my word to us as one. Not just in London. I know we've got mothers from Birmingham. We've got people from Manchester. We've got people from Liverpool. We've got people from Canterbury. We've got people from all over Great Britain. This is us united as one. There's something about the British public who may never have been able to stand with all those families that have lost loved ones. But being able to say, I'm coming out of my hub, I'm coming out of my little corner, I'm coming out of the comfort of my home, and I'm standing here with these hurting families to say, I stand with you in your grief, I stand with you in your pain, and I'm here to shout out loud and clear, we don't want this. Joining the United Front was Caroline King on Zilla, the mother of Oliver, a South London teenager stabbed to death less than 24 hours before the march. This woman, how many of you remember Oliver? The, the young boy who got killed just on Friday. That is the mother of the latest youth victim of this wickedness in our city. I just called them last night. I said, there's a walk. I hope you can come. Immediately, she came out with her family to come and take a stand to say, in spite of her pain, in spite of her pain, we've had enough of this. And this has to come to a stop. Some mothers may say, the pain is too much for me. I can't come out. I can't come to, into the public. I can't take a stand. But when I saw her there, I was so elated. And um, asking her to come to the stage was just so special. That was a moment for her and for all of us. For all of us, a moment of courage. Oliver king Onzilla was 19, a prize-winning footballer. He became the 20th teenager to be stabbed to death in London last year. His funeral became another rallying point. We have gathered here today on this very sad occasion to mourn, to comfort the family of Oliver King Godzilla. We pray for the strength to go through this service. We all know the tragic circumstances surrounding Oliver's death. It was a Friday, I just came from church. Oliver came in, he went upstairs. He got changed, he was coming down. And then my brother and myself were asking, where are you going? Then he said, I'm going to a little party with my friend. And my brother said, don't be long. He said, no, I won't be long. So then he went. I spoke to him on Friday. And he died on Saturday. Oliver King on Zilla was stabbed many times. Not only in his body, but also in his face. His mother had not seen him before the funeral and wasn't sure she wanted to. For the beginning, we didn't want to open the coffin. He said, we don't know how bad he was injured because I didn't see the body. I didn't see Since he died, I wanted to keep his memory that night when he was going up. Very happy, very, very handsome. But Caroline knew the funeral would be attended by many young people, and she saw an opportunity to send a message, one intended to shock. In another way, I wanted them to see. I was thinking that if they open and they see all those injuries he had on his face, 
to see what you know what your action can bring us consequences in the life of people by making her son visible in an open casket with his facial injuries there for all to see Caroline King Onzilla hoped he would serve as an important deterrent to anyone thinking about carrying a knife having that coffin opened up for in spite of the fact that he'd been stabbed in the face and you know again that seeing his face and you know it, it was very challenging for so many people but I think that some young people one two three or fifty or hundred I don't know would look at Oliver and say this is not what I want to do to another human being this is not how I want to end up um, and you know whatever they need to do her message was to just try to deter people from killing her son was a great kid and didn't need to be killed and that's the message she wanted to get across you don't need to destroy and steal lives if you walk on the street carrying a knife and you look at me eye to eye you will never have peace where are we going something has to be done Finding that something is what everyone involved in the battle to end the spiral of violence and teenage deaths is determined to do. But according to those in the front line, the real truth about knife crime in Britain today is that there is no simple solution. At the moment, we don't really in invest in early intervention to divert young people from serious crime. We kind of allow the young person to run until they've got themselves into a situation which is you know, life-changing and even to the point where it might involve injury to themselves or to other people. So I think early intervention in supportive and social ways is an absolutely critical part of this process. Knives and young people and violence is a big complex problem. We tend to start looking for big complex solutions. I think we forget the importance of the simple solutions. Good families and good parents. Good social neighbourhoods and communities things to do, good education, good positive male role models in young men's lives. Th those are straightforward, simple things, and if you look back, those are things that always worked. The police role is about preventing crime and detecting crime, and, in of and often we are at the end of the process. So if you get the parenting, the education, the employment, and all of those pieces right, then actually the demands on policing, the demands on the health service in terms of people being admitted to hospital with injuries, go down. Let us remember the person we had fun with, the person we went to school with, the person we played football with. He was young, but yet he made an impression, and that we must remember.